When most people think of Florida, they think of theme parks, beaches, and football, but our state is full of rich stories and art of our diverse people. The folk art and stories of Florida coming alive in many ways thanks to today's guest. Hello everyone, I'm Charna davis Weesey. Welcome to UCF Profiles and help me welcome Kristen Congdon. I'm so glad to have you here because you are so busy. I can't believe I can have you in one place all to myself for half an hour. Oh, Thank you. It's always nice to talk to anybody who's interested in folk art and folk tales. Love it, love it, love it. And I, I told you my, my mom had an antique store, so I grew up with the stuff all around us, but she didn't have an appreciation for it, and I did. And every once in a while we'd run into it, and I would beg her, Mommy, can I have that? And oh, no, 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 no. And as it became more popular and more valuable, well, it's she realized, oh, there's something there. But what I loved about it, it, it was so free. It was almost, when I look at a piece of folk art, it's almost as if there was no, the person doing it didn't really care if someone was gonna buy it, didn't care what a critic was going to say. Do you know what I, did sure, you know what I, I know say? What, what you mean. Um, a lot of our uh, folk artists make art because they have to make art. Uh, they do it for a number of different reasons. And for example, Ruby Williams started making art because she needed to sell her fruit and vegetables on her produce stand on Highway 60. So whether or not it was sold really was important. Well, it was mostly to sell the right. produce, but to attract people. And then oh. when people came by and saw the signs, then they would stop and say, well, yeah, I would like some strawberries, but I, I would really like that <laughs> sign too. And eventually she realized that she could make a whole lot more money selling her signs, which grew into characters that she remembered as or invented when she was a child. And then they grew into little folk sayings that would say things like stay in school or it hates it hurts to hate or time and me is wrong or I'm tired of being the, the good guy. Things that she was feeling and so it was a way of communicating to the world um, about her identity being greater than just selling produce. You know, I always think of, of that old Sally Field thing when she got the Academy Award, you really like me. <laughs> and so that must be the feeling when you, she had such a reaction to her stuff. Well, and of course now she's in the Smithsonian and she's collected <laughs> around the world and people come from all over to meet her. Um, and in fact, she drives around saying, you know, it's hard to be famous. <laughs> right, right. Uh, for the people who aren't familiar yes. with folk art, yes. is there a definition to it? Is, it, is, there a, uh, is there a way for someone to spot it who's never seen it before? And of course that's the big scholarly question that scholars will What's get together and, and argue um, from here to kingdom come. I actually wrote my dissertation on that topic which was 300 pages and it didn't settle anything. <laughs> um, it comes from the roots of two different disciplines and the folklorists will talk about it as traditional. So they think of it as something that is done within a community context or a family context and it is passed down from one generation to another. Um, so tradition is what they look for. If you're an art historian though, generally speaking, you look at something that's idiosyncratic or self-taught. And so when they talk about, and this is, these are big generalities, but when they talk about it, they think about the isolated, lone person who does something that is totally different from anyone else. And so their emphasis is on the art and the original, whereas the folklorist um, is emphasis is on the folk and the community. So. 30 years ago when they got together there was this really huge debate over who would sort of own the term. And as, as things have changed in scholarship, we realize that innovation and tradition are important to look at in all kinds of art. So while we still use the term folk art, uh, a lot of people say that there really is only art. Um, I still use the term folk art because it designates something for me that has to do with a community context. And if you understand the community context, then you're understanding the meaning or the function of the art a whole lot better than you would if you just looked at what was inside the frame. Right. And, and I think also, I think there's a, a, 
I don't want to say a homemade quality. There's a quality to it that's almost an innocence, almost. Uh, do, you, do you know what I'm saying? I know exactly what you're saying. There's a um, a sense about the the doing of it that comes from the aesthetics of the community. And so they aren't the kinds of things that you would generally learn in an art school. And this is one of the problems that people have had when looking at it. So it's generally the academically trained people who come and look at folk art, and then they use terms like unsophisticated or naive or simple, which are totally wrong. Because if you place yourself in the context of those people, then you understand that it's very complex. It's very sophisticated, and it has its own cultural traditions in terms of how to understand it and see more it. More rich, more innocent, stands on its own type it, of thing to my, in my mind. Right, mm -hmm. but, and, but it's refreshing. It's refreshing mm -hmm. to those of us who are trained academically in art to see somebody who does something, who has the, the um, wherewithal, who has the kind of the, the guts to express themselves in something in a way that's totally unique. And it's difficult. It's really difficult. I used to have something when I was a reporter on my desk, it was a little sign that said, being a writer, there's nothing like a blank piece of paper to tell a writer it's time to clean the refrigerator. So oh. it's almost the same thing with a canvas to be able to, it takes a lot of guts to go ahead and do it and put yourself right. out there for everybody to look at and judge. But China, that's a brilliant <laughs> statement that you just said because <laughs> it really is a way of ordering the world. And that's what we've tried to do with this um, website that we've designed and a group of us have been working on for several years. It's www.folkvine, that's F-O-L-K-V-I-N-E dot org. And what we've tried to do is place Central Florida and some um, Florida, state Florida artists on the web. And what we want to do is express the, the way they organize their world. In other words, like if you were going to write something, if I was going to write something, I would need to maybe clean the house a little bit, <laughs> like you're saying, um, get the laundry done, because then in my head, I'm you're ready. Clear. <laughs> I'm clear. But for, and it works that way for a lot of folk artists too. Um, for example, um, a Cocoa Beach folk artist named Kurt Zimmerman, uh, he paints animals. They're, but I he love started, his stuff. Yes, he started painting I've, those I've been animals. on Folk Vine before, that's okay, why I've seen them. Okay, so you've seen yeah. it. But he did that because he needed to clear his mind, and he started painting animals that were roadkill. And he really wanted to um, send those animals, their spirit or their soul, to another world. And because he worked at the Space Coast and he had seen UFOs, he believes that there are other worlds that you go to when you are violently killed like that. And it relates to his time in, in World War II as well. As a, um, an immigrant to the United States, as a German immigrant, when coming here when he was four years old, he was drafted into the um, service and had to go bomb his hometown. And so to, or, to order his world in a way that makes sense so that you can carry on, so that you're still doing good in the world, he paints things that then go on to another life their soul is sent on. It's a way of honoring, a way of, uh, of sending them off. You know, we t I talked with a professor who talked the same thing about ritual, even in, in with, with very um, quote-unquote unsophisticated peoples or tribes, that the ritual actually is a way to help them deal. Right, with, with very things. difficult kinds of things. To make, them, to make sense out of things. Right, right. So it's the same thing with art. Exactly. It's a way of ordering or understanding your world. And that's why so much art, particularly traditional art, is used in ritual, because it then reorders the world in a way that makes it balanced and okay so that you can go on. That's why you have holidays. That's why you have all kinds of rituals. And that's why we do something special during those times, which often involves the visual. And it's interesting, too, because the, the, the feelings and the emotions and the circumstances that go into it for the artist, and then uh, somebody looks at it and feels something, but can't really place, the, the feelings transfer, but you're not really sure what they are. You, you wow. feel them anyway. Yes, <laughs> I think that's really amazing, because it's when, like, it's what, when you walk into a ritual space that is not a ritualistic um, tradition that you're familiar with, you still feel there's something really special that happens here. It's, it, there's an energy about it, and I guess that's what makes some makes some folk art really work. It's like the the G's Bend quilters, um, this really marvelous group of uh, artists from Alabama who made amazing quilts. 
Um, and now they're seen as some of the best artists ever uh, and being, showing their work all over the world. When you see it, you know immediately. There's something about it that... It moves me. Yes. <laughs> and you want to know more. And so that's when you say, where did these come from? Why did they make these? Why are they designed that way? Why are the stitches this way? How is the ge geometry, um, the asymmetry of it, um, what does that say about who they are? And so it becomes a way of telling a story. I would love to ask Ruby, because I'm intending on meeting her. <laughs> I would love to ask her how that changes once you do get fame, once you do get recognized, or, or is, is it hard to keep the feelings you had when you were creating just to make the signs to sell your vegetables, you know? And that's one of the big questions that people ask all the time about folk artists because once they become um, well known and collectors come and get their work, many people say that the art isn't as good anymore and that what you really need to do is get the early art before all the collectors came and they noticed what sells and what people, people like and so then they supposedly um, make the art more for the customer. And if that happens for all kinds of people, for quilters, the Amish quilters will do that, and, and colors change. And it's and, understandable. Yeah, of course it's <laughs> understandable. Ruby um, is definitely one of those um, artists who says she will not change. She has adapted in certain ways, though. I think one of the really interesting things about Ruby is that when she f had her first museum exhibition in Lakeland, um, you know, nice museum, things on the white walls, um, text panels, the wine and cheese when people come in, that she decided that if they can do that, she needn't have them name her as important. So she has an opening at her produce stand in Ruby's walk-in gallery. Every year, I think it's about, I don't know how many years, 10 at least, every year on the first um, Saturday in November where she invites everyone. And her community comes, collectors come, art people come, and she does her own kind of ritualistic opening, which is about fruit and vegetables, eating healthy food, <laughs> um, learning about her faith learning about the importance of her African-American community. Um, it's almost like a church service. It's keeping it real. It's keeping <laughs> it real. It's exactly keeping it but real. But that's, a, you know, it takes a lot of work. It really takes a lot of motivation to do that. Oh, <laughs> and she works really hard. Of course, she doesn't tell you what her age is because she thinks that people shouldn't ask that kind of question. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> I used to. <laughs> <laughs> so we can understand that. Um, but you, she does most all the work by herself. The invitations, the, a lot of the food. She sets up a stage. And now she's teaching herself to sing. Oh. And play the piano. Unbelievable. We'll talk some more about that in a minute. We'll be right back. We're talking with Kristen Condon and we're talking about um, one of your interests, one of, one of your successes, and one of your passions, folk art. You know, I, I have to say, I have to tell everybody watching that if I had to list all of your awards and, and honors, we would take more than the whole half hour and, <laughs> and I, I really want everybody to know that because it's something really to be proud of. Oh, but we're you. talking about folk art and we also talk about folk tales, which is one of your interests and, right. you know, when I first went on Folkvine and I saw the things on there and when I first learned about Uncle Monday and the folk tales that Zora had collected, right. it was really, and I like to think of myself as a literate person who's interested in the humanities, it was really eye-opening to me because you don't think of Florida having this ri rich history of folk art, of folk stories. And then I remembered going back to living in Gainesville 
And there was more of that. It seemed like maybe it was an, because it was the whole communities, the university, there seemed to be more of that in the little towns on the mm -hmm. outside. But when you come here yeah. to the big city, you're so blinded by everything else yeah. that you forget what makes up Florida. Right. And a lot of the traditional tales are really important in understanding uh, just the cultural heritage that we have here. But one of the interesting things, you talk about folk tales coming from the rural areas. Um, I think it's really interesting to watch how they change when they come into the urban areas. And in Florida, a lot of our folk tales center around alligators because they're just great to talk about. Everybody has an alligator story or just miss or how big they are or how they got your dog or something about an alligator. But um, the alligator stories, which certainly were rural for a long time, are now in sewers and bathtubs and in people's swimming pools and they take on their own con contextual um, telling when they come to the city. And you, even Uncle Monday, he turns into an alligator. And Uncle they, Monday becomes an, an alligator, alligator. <laughs> which is, of course, very important to the way that we understand that story. That whole notion of shape-shifting Uncle Monday as a Seminole and um, hiding from um, the, his enemies coming to Eatonville and going under the water as an alligator and coming up um, with his magical powers um, time and time again. But that idea of shape-shifting, our ability to change into something or have magical powers helps, helps people who are in very difficult situations um, figure out ways to escape it, at least in their imagination. And so that was uh, basically where the Uncle Mundy story came from. Look at, uh, looking into uh, folk stories and folk tales, I, I, I didn't realize that there are different kinds and, and, and legend versus myth versus tall tales. And, right. and um, I, I think that's to, to really understand it is to appreciate, to, to, uh, to appreciate is to understand that there are different types as well. Right, right. So in some of the tales, there's often, like the tall tales, it's just the exaggeration. It's to make life so um, funny. Um, it's the, like the story of, um, by Richard Siemens, he says while well, everybody was trying to get the, the um, cow out of the well because the cow had sunk into the well and nobody knew how to get the cow out and so somebody went down and milked the cow and milked the cow until the <laughs> cow floated up. Or that there was a pumpkin so big that you had to saw it open because you couldn't cut it with a knife so you had to get the big long saws. So those are the kind of the exaggerations that make everybody happy about living here. Um, certainly you could have those about uh, how fast the wind can blow during a hurricane. But then there are the stories about how things came to be and a lot of those for Florida are rooted in Seminole tales. Um, how animals um, stop talking, how we got fire, um, the, the magic of um, rituals and being able to make corn grow, for example. And you know, you, you mentioned the Seminoles, you mentioned the rural people, the agriculture people. There, there's such a huge diversity of people. There are the crackers, the, 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 the cowboys up on Payne's Prairie, and, and uh, in some of the Haitian stories are really amazing too. And I know that's very popular in, in, the, in South Florida where there's a lot of big Haitian communities. And, right. and how they say, what do they say, crick crack? Crick crack. Um, so that's story? before the story, and that lets everybody know, that lets the storyteller know that we're ready to tell the story. Crick crack. Um, so it, it's kind of setting the stage. It kind of moves you from the real world of the everyday and the mundane into a special kind of space or territory. And it, it's the time that says you can cross that boundary now and go into your imagination and see what's going to happen. Talking about Uncle Monday, we really need to back up and, 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 and tell everybody that you actually compiled a series of, of folk stories that were collected by Zora Neale Hurston? Well, some of them were collected them? by Zora Neale Hurston. In the book, um, Uncle Monday and Other Florida Tales, it, they, they have um, stories from the WPA, which Hurston collected, and several others, but they also are tra traditional contemporary tales. So I actually talked to a number of storytellers and uh, I got, got them to tell me their tales. And one of the really important reasons for doing that is to say that folk tales exist today. Folk art exists today. All of these traditions happen right here and now. Um, it's like, I, I always tell my students, we could do a whole book just on 
folk tales in the university because you all have stories about absent-minded professors, <laughs> you all have stories about a lucky charm that you take when you go on, uh, you have an exam, um, you all have stories about the excuse that you give to your professor when you don't turn something in. And the professors, and the professors have know those very, very well. <laughs> we haven't. all know about the grandmother who dies, and we say, Never the grandfather, the grandmothers. <laughs> it's always the grandmothers. The cat never eats the homework. <laughs> no, well, they do sometimes, but now the computers eat up, the, you know, and you lose the paper and you just. Yeah, one of my favorite stories was the III, I, I, the story yes. of the III. I, I. Yes. Can we talk about that one? Because it's just so, you know, it's so sad. The whole story on the way through is so sad with such a great ending and how to deal with his well, life. Well, you know, it's a really the, the story of the wicked stepmother. <laughs> it's sort of the Cinderella story of a little boy who um, was living with a, a mean guardian who made him do all the work. And um, if she, if he, if he, she didn't like how he did it, then he got punished severely. And um, one day she was really mad at him for something, and so she told him that she wanted to go to the market and to get ay ay ay. And of course, the little boy said, "Well, what's ay ay ay? You know, how am I going to go to the market and get ay 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 if I don't know what ay 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 is?" And um, of course, she wasn't going to tell him because she wanted him to fail so that she could punish him. And he goes to the market finally and figures out um, somebody finally helps him get some lobsters and put in the back of the the basket, <laughs> so that when she takes it when he takes it home and gives it to his guardian, she puts her hand in there and goes ay ay ay, <laughs> and um, the screaming brings all the neighbors in and of course. Of course, it's a great community story because they see that he has been treated badly and um, that she will never do that again because they're watching. And there's all kinds of lessons. Finally, he asks for help. Right. He asks for help. He lets other people know. And the story comes out to have a happy ending. And, and that's a, a lot of the folk tales do have that, a way to work through things that are so universal. You mentioned the Cinderella story. You've got that for the turkey maiden as a Cinderella story, Jane's and the Giant Peach. All of these stories, because we really have the same situations, right. don't we? Yes. and We can recognize ourselves in every one. We can. Mm -hmm. And you can look at them with, uh, in terms of archetypes. There's the, the wicked stepmother in tales all over the world. There's the poor person and the jack and the beanstalk, you know, the three wishes. All those happen in folk tales everywhere. The Cinderella story, I don't know how many different versions of that they have. Um, the, the Snow White, the sleeping woman, um, you know, they're, they're just told in different kinds of ways. They're contextualized so that they make sense within the context of the people's traditions who are telling them. Let's talk about the Cultural Heritage Alliance. I don't want to, I don't want to leave it out. What's okay. that? The Cultural Heritage Alliance is a program which I run at the University of Central Florida that is a partnership um, organization. And so what we have is a number of organizations in the community like the Orange County Historical Museum, um, the House of Blues, the International House of Blues Foundation. That has an amazing folklore collection. Uh, that has an amazing folk folklore art collection. collection. <laughs> yes, folk art collection and also has um, a blues schoolhouse. And so they teach kids who do field trips there about the blues and the history of the blues and what the blues is centered in. And so we have about, um, with the Florida Folklore Society is part of it, um, the state programs, the folklore programs for the state. Uh, any number of these programs have partnered with us and we try to do at least one partnership thing a year with them, which is educational. And the, the other part of the Cultural Heritage Alliance is that we try to use newer technology in some way to form um, what our partnership project is. And that's what's inter interesting about Folkvine as well, is, yes. is using the web right. to help educate people on things that are maybe not that technological. Right. And we're trying to ask new questions. What happens when you take a traditional tale that is told orally and you move that tale to the web and you're telling that story through a web-based technology. How does it change? How does it stay the same? Um, who's really the teller at this point? Who owns the tale? And it's the same thing with the um, Folkvine website. While we have the folk artist's work up there, we really realize that we have created another kind of artistic statement that has to do with the artists, the faculty, and the students who have worked on that. So, we get really great scholarly questions that come out of the projects that we do. 
And one of the wonderful things about the Cultural Heritage Alliance that, that I really like is that it's, um, it's research, it's teaching, and it's service. And it's kind of all works together. And it brings it to more people. It does. Kristen Congdon, thank you so much. We, I th we ran out of time. We have 100,000 things more to talk about. So we're, we're, we're going to see you back here when, when I get a chance to get you down here again. Okay, Thanks great. so much I've for joining it. us. Thank I did you. too. And thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time on UCF.